February 27th. I'm Rim. I'm Scott. And this is Geek Nights. Tonight we review an old classic, Super Mario World. Let's do this. You know, sometimes when I do my job, I start to think about how weird is the world where I get paid more money than most humans on this planet to get up, drive to a building somewhere, unplug one cable, plug in another cable, and then stand there to make sure that new cable is working. And uh, you had to go through how many years of training to reach this... Oh, yes. uh... Learning how to unplug this cable consumed much of my college life. Could you have done it, say, I don't know, six years ago? Could you have accomplished this feat? I could have accomplished this feat when I was nine. How come nine-year-olds aren't paid the amount of money you are paid to do the same thing? I don't know. I mean, you could pay a nine-year-old with candy to do the same thing. Well, I guess part of it is that, I mean, realistically, the only reason it was easy is because nothing went wrong. But if that optical circuit had, in fact, not come back up, I would have had a world of trouble to deal with that the nine-year-old would probably have just cried. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I'm uh, I'm going to work the day after tomorrow. Oh, man, new job. Are you going to fall into that rut of work really, really, really hard and try to impress everyone for a month before the decay of the reality that this job is not temporary eats at your soul and eventually you slip into that show up late, leave early, don't do half the work you're supposed to because it doesn't matter? It all depends on how this work goes. There is a chance, albeit a less than 50% chance, that this work is actually a good work. And if it's a good work, then everything's cool. Or it could be just like every other work, in which case, yes, I'll do exactly what you just said. <laughs> <laughs> right, so in the news, you know, it's gaming day. I was going to talk about how Sony has now said that Rumble, who needs Rumble? That's a last generation feature anyway, but I'm not going to. That's not my news, because <laughs> what can I say? Sony is just done. All righty. So I'm going to go way off topic here because a lot of people on the internet have lost their shit over this. Coca-Cola, for those of you who are unaware, is one of the most popular brands of carbonated sugar water in the world. It's true. It's perhaps the number one. And Coca-Cola is doing something crazy. They're changing the design of their cans. What, are they making it blue or what? No, no, no. Actually, it's a really subtle change. They're making them kind of this matte instead of the glossy, shiny that they are currently. They look a lot more like old, old, old cans of Coke. I like that because I like the way the old cans look better than the new ones. I got to admit, I I was, well, one, I don't care about this at all. No, it doesn't make a difference in my life. I mean, I don't even drink soda. I don't drink anything that fizzes, and I don't drink any sodas. Well, why why don't you drink anything that fizzes? Because I don't like fizz. Now, uh, I'm just curious here, in the sake of uh, knowledge and and such, what is it about fizz that you don't like? It feels unpleasant in my mouth. Now, unpleasant how? Is it somehow painful, or...? It is the. It is not a pleasant tingling. It is slightly more pain. It is not painful as an ow, like if I cut my finger, but it is more pain than is pleasant. Uh huh. Like a scratching, only tingly, but tingly more so than necessary. Anyway, I'm not, not sure what I could say about this. I'm just. I'm amused at how seriously people around the world are taking this. Like it's actually somehow a big deal. Yet. I remember when Dr. Pepper changed their 20-ounce thing to be this kind of cone-shaped business, and no one even batted an eye, and people keep changing the designs of cans and bottles, and no one cares, but suddenly, Coke's touching on that, you know, deep-rooted American Coca-Cola and mom's apple pie and baseball, and suddenly everyone loses their shit. It's only because someone said something. If no one said anything, if they just changed it without saying anything... No one would have noticed or cared, except for maybe a few of those nutty people who collect, you know, Coca-Cola memorabilia or something like that. You know, I knew one of those people in high school who had some Crystal Pepsi. Wow. Uh, Quite a bit of it, in fact. Scary. All sealed, and he actually, the dude really, really likes Crystal Pepsi. Oh. And it's a serious (laughs) problem. It's like those people who have, you know, the the wine cellar full of 20 bottles of 100-year-old wine. Yep. It's not like you can ever make more of that. If you really like that... And you drink the last bottle? What kind of life are you going to lead? I actually understand those people's pain because I drank from like the ages of 10 to 23 or 24 Dole 100% pineapple orange juice every morning. 
And then, just recently, perhaps less than a year ago, they changed it completely. It's still, you can go and still to the store to buy Dole 100% pineapple orange juice, but they changed the flavor. It's now actually more apple juice than either orange or pineapple. It, you, it used to be just orange, pineapple, and like a squirt of lemon and maybe some vitamin C or something. See, that's actually a trend that's been going on in the U.S. for a long time now, where apple juice is kind of like how they make chocolate ice cream, where the chocolate overpowers everything else. They don't worry about it. Apple juice is so neutral that in a lot of fruit drinks, they sweeten it mostly with apple juice. Then they add a little bit of whatever flavoring to it in the end. Yeah, well, the pineapple orange juice did not. I drank it because it was so acidic, but it didn't have that, you know, it's it sort of like the pineapple canceled out the part of the orange flavor that I wasn't super fond of, you know, but it was acidic enough to clean out my whole throat in the morning. When they added mostly apple juice to it, and it's now like more than 50% apple juice, it didn't do the same thing anymore. I might as well just drank an apple juice because it wasn't acidic at all. <laughs> so I, I went back and I, now I just drink. I you should have seen well, Scott. He... I tried to mix orange and pineapple juice together and then like squirt lemon juice into it and it totally didn't work. So now I just Scott wasn't drink doing well juice. for about three weeks. <laughs> Every morning he'd get up and I'd hear him downstairs just... Uh, uh, this sucks. Imagine if you drank this. I'd come home, like I'd I'd get up, like he'd get up before me, and I'd wake up to get ready for work or whatever, and I'd see like three glasses dirty with various concoctions, and like the pineapple juice wasn't empty that laying bad. on the floor, <laughs> Scott on the ground naked crying. It wasn't that bad, but <laughs> imagine if you drank the same thing for like over ten years every day, and then it changed, and you could never get any ever again. I mean, I'm over it now, mostly, but if I saw some for sale, I'd totally buy it. Oh, well, in the end, I do, Will, I agree with Scott, though. I kind of like the new aesthetic of the Coke cans. It's really, it really is kind of old school. Yeah, old school is definitely cool, because uh, people have nostalgia for times from before they were born. Actually, people have nostalgia for times that never existed. Really? I, there was a really cool, God, I'll, I'll, if I find it, I'll make it a thing of the day whenever I find it again. But I read an article a while ago about a brand of root beer. I don't remember what brand of root beer it was, but they did a bunch of studies about nostalgia and memory, and they made fake commercials and all this stuff, and they'd basically give people different kinds of root beer and ask them questions about their childhood. Like, do you remember drinking this as a kid? Do you remember? What do you remember about it? And a lot of people, when the brand presented to them was some sort of old-timey styling or nostalgic styling drink, would remember drinking it as a child when, in fact, it did not exist when they were children. Wow. It's very easy to alter non-critical memories in humans. There's actually a lot of cool research about that. It's like DeBella's is actually called, what, Nostalgia Incorporated? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I guess a, a lot of it is like I wasn't alive until the '80s, early '80s. Well, I've, I've and seen I this sorta, with us. Like, I sort of believe that a lot of these things existed before I was born, despite you know not really making sure of it. Even <laughs> recently, a lot of people our age remember Pokemon from way before Pokemon came to the U.S. That's true. Pokemon was it with the the late '90s? Something like the Pokemon's a relative. Oh, God. I was about to say it's Pokemon's relatively... over, like, 10 years old. I was know. about <laughs> to say relatively recent, because think about it. The mid-90s doesn't... No, th- the first Pokemon game was for the original Game Boy. No, but think of this. The mid-90s doesn't sound like it was that long ago. <laughs> oh, no. It's over a decade ago. <laughs> I know. Pokemon's real old. All right. Now that we're on Pokemon, meaning I've very nicely brought this conversation right back around to video games. What's your video game news? All right. So, uh, Metal Gear Solid 3. That's a game that I knew existed. It's it's a, it's a PS2 game. <laughs> I think it's called like substance or subsistence or whatever. God, I, I don't know the word that comes after the colon. We're the best game journalists ever. We play what? DSs and that's it? Something like that. Anyway, uh, it's a game. Uh, actually, I think I saw someone, Greg, playing it once. It's the one with the camouflages and all that stuff, uh, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Apparently, I did not know this game had an online component. A P- now, as you might imagine, it's a PS2 game with an online component. Like, who the hell has the PS2 modem? Barely anybody. And, you know, who the hell has Metal Gear Solid 3 and the PS2 modem? Not too many people. And in the U.S., not too many people. But, apparently, it does exist, and you can play Metal Gear Solid 3 online with the PS2 
in the U.S. It, I, I didn't know this. Wow, uh, good job for keeping those servers up for the few people left. That's a really nice thing to do. Oh, uh, no, on April 2nd, they're going to take them servers down because barely anyone plays this thing. Ah. Uh, uh, see, this illustrates a lot of things that are wrong with the world today. One, it's Tribes 2 all over again. I feel for anyone who still plays this game. Well, I mean, first of all, um, why the hell are you playing Metal Gear Solid 3 multiplayer? Shouldn't you, like... Get a 360 and maybe some Gears of War or something. Hey, some you have nostalgia for games, or if you find a game that's Metal really Gear good, Solid Three, you never know. <laughs> that might have been. I mean, that might have been some kid's Quake Two. You can't really take that away from people. That's a sad kid. Hey, I'm trying to be nice here. I mean, All right, Quake Two is still perhaps one of the best FPSs ever created. But nah, that's I don't the know point. about that. Name a better one other than Tribes Two for ha- the PC. Half Life Two. Half Life Two, yeah, there aren't many. Half Life One, Half Life One multiplayer was pretty meh. Yeah, whatever. All right. Okay. So that's it. They're it's yeah. shutting it down. Yep. It's it. it, it they're, it's like I, I, they're taking servers down that I didn't even realize existed. Which you know, while we're always sort of worried that when you have an online game with some sort of corporate controlled centralized servers. That you could be totally screwed if they decide to take those servers down, especially for MMO people who might have paid like for a year of service or something like that, and then it goes down. Yeah, now a lot of people yell at us nerds, hey, that's not something you should care about, that won't happen. Well, it does happen, but it is good to see that usually it happens when the game is really, really dead, and not when the game is sort of thriving. At least not usually. I mean, this game, Metal Gear Solid 3 Online, is pretty dead. <laughs> I can't Are you imagine. Sure? I, um, you got any numbers? For all you know, that's like the the hot shit on the internet. Uh, I guess it is possible there could be a lot of people playing this, but just my guess as to how many people with PS2s that are online playing this game, it can't be that many. <laughs> it really can't be. This not is not possible. So the fact that they'll keep these servers on that long is kind of good. But the fact that it's even possible for games to stop existing is kind of sad. Things of the day. Scott's running with it with his little theme here. And I got to say, the one he's got tonight is probably the best one. I don't know. It's a tough call. Well, in terms of accuracy... Uh, perhaps, perhaps. There were some ones that are really close, like the Disney ones are Uh, spot fucking on, holy shit. Well, this is a non-Disney one, which means you, so I'm I'm surprised at the level of care put into it. Yeah, it's pretty surprising when you really think about it. Outside of the major studios like Disney and Warner Brothers, a lot of the cartoons don't have opening theme songs with lots of vocal complexity and lots of lyrics and words. And... The ones that do, they sound really bad. It's like only Disney and Warner Brothers can come up with theme songs that have lots of words in them. Yeah, I mean, there's the occasional good rare one. Like, I I will admit, the Sonic Underground opener, for what it is, I kind of like it. Uh, okay. The lyrics aren't that bad. The only part that's really (laughs) cheesy... It, well, uh, never mind. I'll get into that when we actually talk about it. Yeah, but uh, Disney and Warner Brothers also seem to be the only people who can internationalize their theme songs very well. You know, when the songs are sung in different languages, they don't change the songs, they just translate the lyrics to a different language. And it seems to somehow work out. Whereas other people just don't even have lyrical openers to avoid the problem entirely, or they don't change the words and translate them when they bring them to another country, and such and such. Well, today is I have for you a thing of the day that is a rarity. It is not Warner Brothers, nor is it Disney, but it does have a lyrically complex opening song that is translated to German almost perfectly. Now, not only that, I think what really gets it here is that they found a German guy who can sound exactly like Captain Lou Albano. Uh, Yeah, I guess you could say that. It's so perfect. Yeah, it's actually kind of surprising a lot of the voice acting, too, when you hear it. It's like, wow, there's someone who sounds exactly like that guy, only he's a different guy, and he speaks a different language. Look at that. But yeah, the Super Mario Brothers Super Show opener in German. Enjoy. So speaking of Sonic Underground, Sonic Underground was also released in France, 
And the French opener to Sonic Underground is the exact same song, just translated pretty much straight up into French. Though the guy singing it has uh, a more stereotypically French-sounding accent than one would expect. (laughs) But the thing is, uh, I will admit that not only do I really like Manowar, but I also like listening to Manowar singing in French. And... This kind of rock in French is actually music that I kind of enjoy. That's all you. <laughs> Plus, Sonic Underground, for all of its faults, that show tried it tried to do more than you would have expected from children's television of the era. Yeah, I guess maybe. It's closer to a, a bad anime than it is to a bad American cartoon. I'll put it that way. Maybe. In terms of the way the plot goes uh, and all uh, well, that. Anyway, in France, it's called Sonic Le Rebel. Le Rebel. Yeah. So well, there you, know, you have it. I guess because they, they were not saying Sonic Le Resistance. <laughs> Sonic Le Resistance. <laughs> well, there you have it. Two openers to video game related cartoons in languages other than English. Of course, you can, if you really want to get ahead of yourself, you can go to Scott's blog and look at yeah, all I ba- of them. Yeah, I basically went around YouTube for a couple hours today listing these things. So uh, if you go you know, to the forums, I made a post about it, and yeah, go yeah. nuts. You're probably better off just going to the ones we pick as things of the day, just because we're kind of filtering them. They're not all amazing. Some of them are just, oh, wow, it's the Transformers in Spanish. Yep. Wow. Yep. Yeah, we got some good ones tomorrow too. So uh, hold uh, on. I might bring out the heavy hitters tomorrow. I got a heavy hitter. Yeah, we'll see. I don't know if you're gonna try to steal what I want. No, I'm not. I'm not. The one I'm gonna use is also awesome. It's not the one you're thinking of. But anyway, okay. to get off of that, it is video game day, and we've been talking a lot about what have we been doing on video game days the last few. Well, uh, we've been talking about board games and stuff like that. I don't even remember. Yeah. Well, whenever we don't have a better topic, we usually think, all right. What games have we played before that we don't need to prepare at all to talk about? Well, there is one game that came out, the the most recent game, well, not the most recent game on the Virtual Console, but a recent Virtual Console release that I purchased because I never owned it before in my life. Which I couldn't believe. I didn't know that until Scott told me just a few days ago. Yep, and, uh, but I played it many times before in my life, a whole lot, actually. So I decided, you know what, I've never bought this game, yet I've played the hell out of it. I should pay eight bucks for it or whatever. What are the five bucks? I don't know what they were charging. Ah, uh, Nintendo. You. I think it was eight bucks. Nintendo is once again getting us pirates born and bred for most of our lives who have access to superior emulation. We had Nintendos. I owned this game. I still own it. I have the cartridge and a Super Nintendo. And yet we'll spend money to play it on the Wii. Yep. So. I got Super Mario World, the one with Yoshi, the first Super Nintendo Mario game. Arguably, Super Mario World, oh, Super Mario Brothers Four. You arguably could call it. the best or one of the best Mario games ever. I mean, pretty much it and Mario Three are at a dead heat in my book. Yeah, if you ask me, I'll give Mario Three the slight edge, but that's not to say Mario World is not t- awesome. Yep, I mean, there's no way for you to know if that might be partly due to nostalgia for having played one of them a lot more. You know, I think the reason I kind of like Mario 3 a little bit more is it seems like Mario 3 has more of that old school hiddenness that, like, you know, the Metroids would have and, you know, stuff like that. Whereas Mario World, the hiddenness is a little more open and out there, so it's not as exciting. It's more Zelda-y. Like in Mario 3, you'd never know that you can go behind the scenery on white pillars. Yeah, you would never know that you could get that coin, crazy coin ship by getting enough coins in this level that scrolls really fast. Or you'd never know that you could fly off the screen in a particular place, carrying a turtle shell to bust a brick to get inside a pipe that takes you to fuck who knows where. Or going to the far right of the desert using two hammers on blocks that happen one to hammer. be- One hammer. Oh, yeah, I guess you need one. You only need one hammer if you don't waste your hammer on something else. I've never actually bothered to go get that warp whistle. I just knew it was there. Because you only need two warp whistles. You don't need a third one. (laughs) I would go get it just because I would get all three. And then, because see, my strategy to beat Mario 3, well, we're talking about Mario 3 now, is I would get all three of the warp whistles, right? And because what I would do is as soon as I got to World 3, I would beat the boss of World 2, the desert. Then I would warp to World 8. 
because only then extra P wing, extra P wings and clouds. Because beat level two, you get a cloud. That way, I would have exactly the number of P wings and clouds I needed to get to the end of world eight. Man, clouds are dangerous though, because if there's a level that's hard and you skip over it with a cloud, and then you die in the next level. It's not good. Oh. It's real bad. But yeah, we're not going to talk about Mario 3, but um, Mario World, I mean, the secrets are there, but there's Zelda E, where you'll be up and you'll see, like, hey, there's a key and a keyhole over behind that pipe, and I can't get over there. Huh. I wonder how I get that. Yep. Or you'll go over to a level, and on the map, the level will be like a red dot, and if the level's a red dot, you know that level has multiple exits. Or you'll go into a boo house, and a boo house obviously has mad boo secrets in it. So you'll explore the hell out of that boo house, and you'll use your pee blocks all over the place, and it's pretty obvious where a lot of the things are. Like, hey, there's some coins outlining the shape of a door. I wonder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's also, now that I think about it, Mario 3 was one of the last of those old school winning is not a foregone conclusion in Mario 3. And even as a kid, when I was badass at that game, sometimes I would sit down and say, I'm going to beat Mario 3 and fail. Yeah, and Mario. Run out of lives. There's no continue, there's no saving. You gotta go and beat it before mom calls for dinner. Yeah, and also Mario World. You basically have infinite lives, effectively, unless you suck, and the game saves, so you're going to beat it eventually, and once you've beat it, you're done. That's been a big trend in games over the last many years. That It went from this, beat the game, beating the game is the end. The means are entertaining, but the end is beating it, to you're going to beat the game no matter what. The game is more about going around and actually getting everything over time. It's like progress as opposed to one straight shot. Yep. Granted, so, it's not a big deal, but Super Mario World, I actually did own as a kid, and I beat all the way through, and I, I think it's my favorite Mario game. Yeah, it's, it's a damn good Mario game. I remember when I first heard about it, I was like, a cape, a Yoshi, what's that crap? I, what happened to the raccoon tail? Because I like the Mario 3 action, you know? But the thing was, as much as I didn't like Yoshi before I got to, you know, to use Yoshi, when you got Yoshi, he was awesome. You know, and it was pretty, it was like, before Yoshi, you looked at him and you said, I don't like, why are they throwing this green dinosaur into my Mario world? I don't want him in here. Get him out. See, now the reason I didn't worry about that was, think, Mario 1 came out. Great game. Yep. Mario 2, US style, came out. Uh. Now, I, that's I also, it, but it's my number three Mario game. I mean, I can't say if Mario World or Mario 3 is better overall, but Mario 2 is the number two as far as I'm concerned. I don't know about that. but I our, really like Mario 2. I like Mario 2 slash Doki Doki Panic also, but uh, I'm not going to like give it. it incredible praise or anything. It's a good game. Well, maybe. I mean, my like of it is a lot like my like for Zelda 2. Maybe. For some reason, it just grabbed me. I don't know why. <laughs> it's definitely not sequels because I hate most sequels. Yeah. Well, wait, no, I don't. Quake 2? Damn it. Yeah. Oh, well. <laughs> All righty. But Mario 2, as far as the Americans saw it, was this totally different game where they threw in all these new weird monsters and weird mechanics and all these things that never been they weren't in the other Mario game. It yeah. was like this You know what the, you like know what you the, see a shy guy, you're like, wow, that's weird. But then you play Mario World or Mario 3 and you think back and you feel like those shy guys and those ninjas had always been in Mario and you can't imagine them having not been in the Mario universe. Actually, you know what? Is now that I think back on it, when I was a kid I never felt like Mario 2 was really a sequel to Mario. I, you know, because I also had the Zelda 2, which didn't feel like a sequel to Zelda. It felt like some other game with the same character. Even though the instruction Mario book. Mario 2 felt like some other game with the same character. Even though in both cases, the instruction books very clearly made the, uh, the lineage known. Yep. But Mario 3 really felt like a sequel, and Mario World definitely felt like a sequel to Mario 3. Hmm. But you were talking about, you know, how Yoshi, like, why are they adding this weird thing? But every Mario game added weird stuff, and it felt uneasy or strange or, like, just tacked on. Like, ah, oh, they're just trying to add no, something to no, the franchise. it was actually, before playing Mario 3, and I knew about the tale, it was like, ah, oh, yeah. But before playing Mario World, Yoshi was like, what? I yeah. don't know why I had the different feeling, but... Well, not just Yoshi, but all the stuff in Mario World. Uh, I don't know. Some of the stuff in Mario World I kind of accepted. The football uh, Koopa Troopa guys? I love those guys. I like them too, but they were definitely a strange addition. Uh, I guess you could say so. But yeah, once uh, 
like the some of the stuff definitely flowed naturally like the boo houses it's like in mario 3 there were boos and in mario world boo houses it was just a natural progression i guess the the thing i'm talking i'm thinking about more is the idea that it's the nostalgia factor you forget that there weren't boos until mario 3 yeah or that some of the that, people there weren't boos until mario 3 you know where else there were boos though I think in um, uh, Yoshi, the game just Yoshi, I think that had booze in it. I don't know. I think it did. Anyway, but the other thing, music too. Think about some of the songs that are so iconic to Mario and then realize that they were didn't exist until Super Mario World. And yet now they're just, they're part of the Mario universe and you can't imagine that they were never there. Yeah, that's actually kind of true. Sometimes I forget like which songs, I mean it's obvious which songs started in Mario 1. And it's obvious which songs came from Mario 2. But sometimes, like, I forget which songs started in Mario 3 and which ones started in Mario World. And when they you play a game now, like you pick up, say, New Mario Brothers for the DS, and they play a Mario song, you go, that's a Mario song. And someone goes up to you and goes, yeah, which Mario song? And you go, uh, uh. And some of them are easy, like, oh, that's the castle music from Mario 3, or, oh, that's the Boo House music from Mario World, but... Sometimes you're like, uh, uh, and it feels like that music has always been Mario music. You want to say Mario 1, but you know that's not true. It wasn't in there until Mario 4. Holy crap. I think that is the sign of an extremely well done franchise that Nintendo has had such foresight and that when they, or maybe it was random chance. I don't know. Who knows? But the fact that the continuity is so smooth, even when there are jarring transitions from game to game, that... The feeling that the universe is unified, and when you see a thing from a Mario game, you feel like it's always been there, without question. Yeah, I mean, if you can change something, and then... As much as you have. Compare Mario 1 to uh, Mario Sunshine. Yeah, I mean, it's like if you change the can of Coke, and then later, if you change it again, people are upset. (laughs) You know you've done a good change, because what you changed it to is just as beloved as what you had before. So let's talk about Mario World more specifically. Well, uh, the plot is that the princess has been kidnapped. By Koopa. And it's Koopa Kids. Well, it's not the Koopa Kid that you know nowadays. It's the same Koopa Kids that were in Mario 3. See, if, if you played Mario 3 in Mario World, King Koopa had, what, like seven kids, I think? Bunch of kids. Yeah, like Iggy Koopa. Wendy was the worst one. Wendy was the bitch. God, Wendy. And, With those uh, candy rings that she threw around. And ah. and Ludwig von Koopa and all sorts of other, what were the other, I don't, can't remember. If you can name all the Koopa kids, you win a prize. Yeah. A prize oh, man. of nothing. I've got this great piece of art that I still have to hang on the wall of the real awesome new Koopa kid, who is one of my favorite characters in any video game ever. Being beat up and trying to get away from all of his, I guess, stepbrothers and his stepsisters. Yeah, the old Koopa kids that were from Mario 3 and Mario World. Yeah. It's by that Brandon Kramer guy who we keep talking about. Yeah, the awesome art dude. Anyway, so basically, you're Mario. You go from level to level, world to world. Each world has one Koopa kid as the boss. And in the final world, Bowser is the boss, and he's a motherfucker. Yeah, it follows the same kind of idea of Mario 3, where there's this overworld, and you travel along lines from dot to dot going into worlds and fighting, and sometimes there are multiple paths or secrets or different ways to go, but there's a big wide world to explore. Unlike Mario 3, you can go between worlds easily. You can also revisit worlds, which is a huge difference from Mario 3. In Mario 3, you would beat a world, the world is beaten. You can't go back into it. In Mario World... You go back into a level, you can, like, pick up a mushroom at the beginning of it and then quit. Or you can go into a level, pick up the one secret you missed, and then quit the level as soon as you get the secret. You know, it it's, allows you to just keep experiencing any part of the game you want to experience at any time. Yeah, not many games really use that mechanic until after Mario 3. Well, games had a mechanic where... You could, see, this is kind of weird, because Mario World was one of the first games to let you revisit levels, but you never had to revisit a level. There was no reason to, other than to get, you know, say, pick up a mushroom, you know, easily, in an easy level. Or Or to reopen a secret that you didn't open. Yep. But you don't need any of the secrets to win the game. You don't need them. You know, there was, there's no reason to, or necessariness of backtracking. Well, it can be necessary. In the, uh, in the Mystic Forest, 
if there's that one level where if you beat it by one exit, it actually makes a loop that doesn't take you anywhere, then you uh, have to go back it, in. I guess it could be necessary, yes. But it's not... In general, no. It's in just, general, it is possible to beat the game without repeating any levels. You know, But uh, yeah, it wasn't until much after Mario World where they actually made games where backtracking was you know, like, re- important and useful and you needed to do it a lot more. In Mario World, you only could do it to get some extra secrets. Now, we don't really need to talk much more about how Super Mario World worked. If, you, if you've played the game before, you know how it worked. If you've never played it and you have a Wii and you don't feel like dealing with emulation, I highly recommend it. It is one of the best Mario games ever. Yeah, you're pretty much, it's, you're not a gamer if you haven't played, beaten Mario World. I, I mean, mean it's, it's so classic. It, it's like having not seen Star Wars. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to try to beat the game 100% every single level and every single secret. But you don't have to do that. You just have to beat the game straight through, and that's good enough. But if you haven't played it at all, wow, that's scary. So let's talk about all the interesting, fun things in this game. Because one thing... Boo houses. Boo boo houses. I don't think you all understand Scott's fetish for boo. (laughs) Fetish? Scott has this unhealthy obsession with boo. Though I'll admit, boo is pretty awesome. Boo is the awesomest. I understand it. Yeah. He's got a stuffed boo that he has in his room. Yeah, basically, in Mario 3, there was boo. But all Boo was was the ghost. And if you looked at him, he would cover his eyes. And if you turned your back to him, he would sneak up on you. Now, this is really cute in and of itself. Yeah, well, Mario World had the same Boo that you had in Mario 3. It also had a whole bunch more Boos. There were silly Boos and shy Boos and gigantic Boos. And Boos came in different formations. Like, some Boos would turn into rocks that you could stand on when you looked at them. But if you looked away, they'd turn into a Boo and try to get you. There would be gigantic boos that you had to jump over without touching them. There would be rings of boos that would spin around and only live you one, like one point of entry if you wanted to jump through them. There would be like millions of boos flying in the ceiling and then they would swoop down on you trying to get you like the sun in Mario 3 did. Those are actually my favorite kinds of boos. They were kind they were like this mass of semi-translucent boos that would materialize whenever you got near them and swoop in. Yeah, there were lots of crazy different boos, and it, it definitely, you know, it always felt cool because there'd be these haunted houses that you had to go into, and Yoshi wouldn't go inside. Yeah, Yoshi, how useless are you? Whenever I really need you, you abandon me. Yeah, I mean, if you had Yoshi in a boo house, holy shit, you could wreck that place up because you get hit by a boo, you just land on Yoshi again. Get hit by a boo, land on Yoshi again. <laughs> It'd be all great. But no, he doesn't come with you in the boo house. Makes it all hard. But yeah, the boo houses were always cool because... They were less about the platforming, jumping from thing to thing, you know, tricky timing and maneuvering and reflexes that the other levels had. And it was more about finding the secret way to go to different paths while these ghosts were pestering you. And basically, the ghosts worked to limit your time in the level. I mean, if the ghosts weren't there, it would be stupid easy because you could just walk around and do whatever you want. But because the ghosts are there, you pretty much... Not only do you have to find these secrets and figure them out with tricky thinking, you have to do it really fast, because if you don't work fast enough, the booze will descend on you and kill you. Now, the boo houses also had numerous secrets, some of which were actually very fucking difficult to get a hold of. (laughs) Mostly because booze harassed you while you tried to get them. Yeah. See, one of the great things about this game was the secrets, and while Scott says he's going to try to beat the game 100%, I did so when I was a kid. And it took me months, months and months, most of which was spent trying to beat the Star World and the super secret Star World of which Scott was existed, uh, was dubious of the existence thereof. Well, yeah, because I didn't own a Super Nintendo as a Sega Genesis kid, but I played Super Mario World a lot at my friend's houses and my cousin's house. And I had seen and played the majority of the game, but I had never seen... Like, this double-plus Star World ever, so I didn't, you know, believe it existed. Yeah, so Scott's going around to the Star World, and I said, Hey, are you gonna go to Tubular and Awesome and all those places? And he's like, What? What are you talking about? So I said, You see that big pillar in the middle of the Star World? If you beat all the Star Worlds around, you can go up there, there's another star. And it takes you to this magical world where... You can't win, and it's fucking impossible, and I threw the controller at my TV like 12 times as a kid. (laughs) And they get, like, each one is harder than the last. And they're not, like, normal Mario levels. They're, like, a normal level from these ga- this game, just a little bit bigger. 
except that you have to get the secret exit to advance, and it's just impossible. We'll see how... I'll do that last, probably. They were really hard, but if you beat them all and get to the end, you can go in this final star, and it changes the rest of the game. It changes the color palette. All the Coopers are now wearing Mario masks. It changes a whole bunch of stuff all over the game permanently. That's pretty crazy stuff right there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Another thing I like about the Star Worlds is that it's sort of like the whole game, you have this green Yoshi who does what he does, and if he eats certain shells, he can do other things. If you go to the Star World, you can get these other colored Yoshis, and it's like, whoa. You know, remember I was talking about that sort sense of- Sense of wonder? Yeah, that sense of wonder and sort of, holy crap, look at that secret. That Mario 3 definitely had more of that than Mario World God, does. when I got a blue Yoshi, I was so excited about yeah, that. Cause, but Mario World definitely still had it, and where it had it was in the Star World. Where all this crazy shit was happening. Yep, like you'd see, you know, yellow shells and red shells and blue shells, and they did stuff. And then one day, I stumbled upon a flashing shell. And I thought to myself, I wonder what would happen if Yoshi ate that. And it turned out it had the powers of all three shells at the same time. Yeah. It was crazy. <laughs> it was super crazy. The game also, honestly, has one of the best learning curves of any Mario game out there. It starts out really, really easy, but not stupidly easy. Oh, that's very true. I mean, most Mario games, like the first level of, say, Mario Brothers 1 is so easy. I mean, if you figure out the controls, you can beat that level. You might not beat it well, but you can beat it. But then again, at least that was the first Mario game. So it's not like anyone had any experience and all of us died on the first Goomba at least once. Yep. But it's, you know, it's so easy that someone who's good at the game won't really find it interesting at all. In Mario World, even the earliest levels, which are a lot easier than the later levels, are complex enough to still be interesting to play when you have a high skill level. Yeah, it's like they have this perfect balance of introducing new elements at a rate to where you will understand them and see their uses, introducing novel uses of things you already knew about, introducing new kinds of enemies, new mechanics, whatever, and they do it so that the game never gets old. The moment you think you've got the game under control, it steps the difficulty up this tiny little bit and adds one more little complication. And by the end of the game, when you're in the Mystic Forest or by the, the ghost ship, you'll look back and you'll look at what you're doing in the game and be amazed at how good you are at this game compared to when you started. Like, the game trains you to be good at Mario games. Yeah. And like, whereas in Mario 3, you know, there were different kinds of levels. Even in Mario 1, there were different kinds of levels. There's a normal level, an underground level, a bridge flying fish level. A mushroom, or uh, the pillars level. Those the, long yep, pillars mushroom, with mushroom pillars tops. level, an underwater level, and a castle level, you know? In Mario World, they keep throwing all sorts of new kinds of levels at you, and that's what really keeps your interest going. I mean... You know, there'll be one level where dolphins are coming out of the water, and it's crazy. And it's like, whoa, this is a new kind of level. It's a dolphin level. What the hell's up with that? Yeah, and the thing is, the game has enough novel stuff in it that throughout the entire game, you are constantly running into new things. Until the very end, where it takes all the things you've learned and throws them at you as hard as possible. Yeah, but you're never gonna, you know... you. If you keep beating levels, you're going to keep running into new stuff, and you're going to yeah. keep being excited to keep playing. Like, even as late in the game as the Mystic Forest, which is pretty late. You've gone through a lot of the game at that point. Now there's bubbles, and there's wigglers, and there's bob suddenly, and... Yeah, I mean, even Mario 3 didn't do such a good a job at that, you know? Because Mario 3, basically, each world had a type of level. You know, all of the levels in World 7 were mostly sort of kind of the same. Yeah, I mean, in general, you could, like, some. there were definitely some water levels and underground levels and platforms moving through the air levels yep. and standard platformer levels. Levels that scroll on their own and levels that you scroll. Yeah. Mario games are all about the kinds of levels. At least 2D Mario games are. A lot of people don't realize that. One thing I do remember from Mario 3, though, was that the worlds were so different and exotic. Maybe it was partly because you couldn't save the game. So certain levels, like level five and six and seven, you didn't see often in your life. Ah, like if you that's wanted very to, true. If you wanted to see these levels, you either had to have a game genie or you just had to start and play through the game enough to get to them. So and when you got to them, you only got to play them once. As soon as you walked past a pipe... That pipe was gone. You weren't going to see that pipe unless you died or unless you played the whole game again up to that point. 
And it was definitely the sense of like the cloud world and then the, like the tower to the top. And you just, you, it's the sense oh, that of wonder. tower was so high. I, I love that so much. Of course, I was kind of pissed when I got to the top and found out there was a whole nother level that was twice as hard. Yeah, that, see, the thing is World 5 on the ground is, is part, one of the best worlds. And that tower is one of the best. Because it, like, it's like they have a different set. I mean, I don't know who designed all the different levels, like who did what level in Mario 3. But I would guess that a different team did World 5. Maybe. Because it's just so different from the whole rest of the game. I don't know the how game. they snuck that caribou shoe in there, but I don't know why the caribou shoe is not in Mario oh, World. Oh, Curryboe's shoe is the... Ah. Uh. Uh, anyway, that's why. That's, I think that's what makes Mario 3 better than Mario World. Definitely. Is yeah. that sort of thing. But at the, at the same time, Mario World is such a precise, polished game with like no flaws. Well, no, no flaws other than flaws that are inherent in 2D platformers. Yeah, I don't really see anything wrong with Mario World at all. A lot of people don't like the Mystic, Mystic Forest World. I don't like the Mystic Forest, but just because I don't like it. There's nothing wrong with it. I just don't like it. Yeah, I personally really don't like Vanilla Dome. I love the Vanilla Dome. That's the best. Nah, and the nah. Butter Bridge. Butter Bridge is pretty good. I like the Butter Bridge. Man, getting to Butter Bridge was always the... Like, whenever I started a new game, like, when I got to Butter Bridge is when I felt like I had the game under control. Like, I've crossed the bridge, I am now ready to kick some ass. Oh, see, for me, it was like, as soon as I got into the Vanilla Dome, like, that's when the game started. Before oh. the Vanilla Dome was sort of like this pre-game wussy crap. I don't know, for me, the Vanilla Dome was not really wussy, but the Vanilla Dome was like this, like the calm before the storm, like, this is the last easy level, or this is the last meh level, and then everything gets crazy. Uh, whatever. It's Mario World. It's awesome. Yeah, really, if you haven't played... Super Mario World, you have to buy this game on the Virtual Console, or at least emulate it and play it. It is, Or get a Super Nintendo and a copy of Mario World, Yeah, or whatever. Find a way to play the game and play it, if you haven't. If you have, maybe it's time to go back and play it again. That's what I'm doing. Yeah, I'm probably going to once I finish, finish uh, Phoenix Wright 2, which I'm working on. And then we could talk about that, sh that game as well. Yeah. Of course, if you are looking for our New York Comic Con convention coverage, you'll get that tomorrow, since tomorrow is Anime, Manga, and Comics Day. Holy crap. And tomorrow, we're going to start a contest, since CPM gave us a bunch of free goodies at the con that I really have no desire to own, so I'm going to give them away to you nice people. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music. Be sure to visit our website at www.frontroadcrew.com where you'll find show notes, links, our awesome forum, a link to our Frapper map, and links to all the RSS feeds. We say feeds plural because Geek Nights airs four nights a week covering four different brands of geekery. Mondays are science and technology. Tuesdays, we have video games, board games, and RPGs. Wednesdays are anime, manga, comic nights. And Thursdays are the catch-alls for various rants and tomfoolery. You can send us feedback by email to geeknights at frontrowcrew.com. Or you can send audio feedback via Odeo. Just click the link that says send me an audio on the right side of our website. If you like what you hear, you can catch the last 100 episodes in iTunes or in your favorite podcatcher. For the complete archives, visit the website, which has everything. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 2.5 license. This means you can do whatever you want with it, as long as you give us credit, don't make money, and share it in kind. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night.